Well, hello and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I am with my good friend and birthday boy, Vincent LaFerre. How you hey, doing? Hey, Cappy. Uh, well, um, welcome. Thank you for you know joining us on our on our Photo Brigade podcast. I'm I'm really excited to chat with you for the first time on video. I know we've done this twice before. Well, actually three times before, yep. if you count the first time way back when, when I was in uh, college. Yeah. So we'll, we'll jump into that and talk more about it because I've actually got some videos of us looking much younger and me with some sideburns down to here. Yeah. Uh, rockabilly or, you know, rock star. It was, it was pretty good looking, I got to say, although my wife doesn't quite agree anymore. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, how are you doing? You're, uh, you're right now. You used to live here. <coughs> Excuse me. Had Sorry, it, we'll let getting our, over bronchitis. Getting over bronchitis. Sorry to hear that. But um, you, you now are used to be based here in New York, and Correct. we used to hang out all the time. But now yeah. you're based in LA and New York. Correct. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So I moved to LA about uh, three, four years ago. Uh huh. Maybe it's been five. Time's been flying. <laughs> um, 2009. So it's been five years. Uh-huh. Longer than that now. Right. And um, I miss New York so much. It was such a big part of who I was. You know, having grown up in New York City, having uh, worked at the New York Times, having uh, shot aerials over New York City, and just missed the people. Um, and I actually broke my arm last year, and I spent two months recovering here. I saw that a lot of my friends were still here, and I was like, I really miss it. So I decided to kind of go by coastal and I joked that I split my time between L.A. with my kids, uh, New York, and then, of course, a suitcase. And a suitcase. I go. Because you're always on the road. You're always Pretty either- much. As a director, or as a photographer, whatever it is, uh, I would say 90% of my work is away from home. In fact, there's more work in New York now there isn't, than there is in L.A., which is interesting. Interesting. Yeah. For, for directing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because of the tax incentives, because oh. of the trends, uh, work in L.A. is relatively rare. Uh, unless you're in episodic television or on big feature films on the lots, uh, most people will go to New York or uh, Louisiana. Or it used to be Michigan, but the tax credits, you know, are, are gone there. Mm-hmm. So it's just uh, it's just kind of the way the business has gone. And frankly, too, there have been so many commercials and things shot in L.A. It starts to get a little old, and New York's become super film friendly. Uh-huh. And uh, who would want to work anywhere else? You know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's why I'm back. Absolutely. All right. So before we jump into um, everything, I just want to give a couple quick shouts um, to those professional organizations that I always shout, ASMP, MPPA. I don't know if there's any uh, big professional organizations in the uh, video film Um, world. Directors Guild of America, Local 600. um, All these all these organizations sort of protect the rights and and help out uh, us us photographers and videographers. So mm-hmm. check those out and become a member and get involved in a community to, to help out. Um, also want to say thanks uh, to Tenba. Uh, they're always helping support this uh, great podcast. Um, also, Canon. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I'm actually going to be getting mugs soon for these mm-hmm. uh, uh, for our water. But until then, my, my uh, silly little fake Canon cups will do. Well, Tembla gets a shameless plug with a lot of the bags they have. Yeah. using their GoPro bags. Oh, right yeah, yeah. Tembla's got a great GoPro it's, bag. Uh, I, can't, I can't do expletives here. So it's hey. kick butt. They, the best they kick butt, with. those Tenma bags. And uh, it, uh, it's really good stuff. They're okay, yeah, yeah. To, to travel it's, with. it's amazing how there's not really any bags out there specifically for GoPros. And yeah, so I mean, it was really cool uh, that they came my out. My friend and assistant Mike Geiser, who you know well. Uh, it's right there. Oh, there he is. Wow, <laughs> that just happened. Just plopped out of nowhere. Uh, he travels with those bags, and he has like every single accessory in there. And it's small, it's compact, and it's pretty cool. Otherwise, my GoPros have always been in 70,000 pieces and all over the place, and it's uh-huh. a mess. So anyways. So yeah, so Temba Bags. Check out Temba.com and all their different uh, great bags. Also, uh, just want to let you know, you you probably are watch, might be watching this live right now on our website. Uh, it's uh, thephotobrigade.com slash live, um, where you can see our live stream uh, podcast like we're doing now, as well as our upcoming events. We have speakers that come into this space and and we do different uh, uh, talking gigs and everything. So check out our YouTube channel, um, Photo Brigade, and uh, hit the subscribe button. We're going to be putting up all sorts of really cool content in the coming uh, year, that's for sure. All right, so let's get into this. Vince, you and I met about 10 years, more than 10 years ago now, um, at a sports shooter workshop. Um, and I think it was the, this microphone keeps like creeping towards me. I don't know what to do about it. It's attracted to you. Yes. Um, and so, <laughs> and so, um, 
I was just a student at, at Ohio University, mm -hmm. and Sports Shooter was sort of the big social media back mm -hmm. then. It was the only. It was the only media. social media. It was before Facebook. It was. It was really the only way to connect. Not the only way, but it was really the best way to connect with other photographers and like-minded people. And it was great for photog you know, young kids like myself to be able to connect with. Uh, veterans in the in the industry uh, like yourself and in fact I, I when I was in school I did a project uh, with you way oh, back God. when and we, we looked a, a lot different back then uh, look at you Vince age has not been kind to me yeah yep. no it has Just not get that picture up and then there's there's me with my wow. awesome sideburns yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this is my, my Viscom class about mm -hmm. a School of Visual Communications at Ohio University. And that um, was the first time I ever did a, a, an iChat type or Skype yep. you know, on video. It was very odd, but it, it was, was kind of cool. It was, I was very, very tired, I remember. This is not very good quality, but I want to bring this bring this up real quick just to kind of show what it was like back then. So this was a first of its kind uh, yeah. uh, uh, iChat uh, was back when the iSight just came out for the and and I think that you ended up buying one yeah under you know me saying hey look they've got this new thing we'll send you one and then mm. you ended up buying one because you were just about to have a kid you're about to go to the Olympics yeah and you figured you could use it yep so I'm just gonna play this real quick and show you what it just give it we're up. ready everything up and ready guys yeah. all right Vince this is my uh, FICO 392 advanced <laughs> photojournalism uh, picture story class Say hello. <laughs> yeah. So, Vico. Vico, not Psycho. <laughs> so, anyway, um, everyone, this is Vince Lafrey, the New York Times. Um, all right, we got so, it. So, yeah, we got it. Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to, to give everybody a quick, little quick uh, uh, preview little into what it was like back then. About oh, did I hit it? Okay. Hey, guys. Uh, Help me out. There you there go. There we go. All right. So, how do, how does that feel looking back at? Uh, Let's just move on. No, I mean, it, <laughs> I mean, is it is it is it crazy to think that that was actually like ten years ago? I mean, eleven years ago. I remember years at ago? the time. What's funny about it is at the time it was so quote unquote cutting edge, and now we walk around on our phones and we you know talk to everyone on Facetime. Yeah. I mean, I get more and more people Facetiming now in audio or video, uh -huh. and uh, some people like actually exclusively call me on Facetime audio, which is kind of weird. That is kind of weird, and it's just started already, and that's the way it is. Yeah. And it's great for, like you said, you you had gotten it. Uh, the iPhone wasn't out back then. The iPhone wasn't out. That wasn't yeah. even until I moved to New York, it's which been, was years later. It's been eight years. Yeah. yeah. So so we met at the Sports Shooter Workshop, um, and, and I ended up doing this project on you. Mm -hmm. And I ended up sort of following in your footsteps. I, I interned at the LA Times. Mm -hmm. And then at that point I, is when I really started connecting with you, saying, hey, look, I, I really want to make it to New York. I want to mm -hmm. try to intern for the New York Times. And you were yeah. so kind as to take the time i remember you at the world series you still owe me that money <laughs> do i owe you some money for that yeah, you do okay well you were at the uh, world series charge interest you know <laughs> and you i was telling you i needed help with the portfolio review and you just told me to upload my 100 favorite photos to a server mm -hmm. and you built my portfolio for me uh, i remember that but cool yeah well you did that that was really nice of you so just kind of shows how um things kind of work out there cool. so um anyways i ended up uh, interning and uh working with you and and you were very much a, a mentor to me right. um one of the interesting stories is i was uh interning and they were trying to send me down to katrina mm -hmm. which you ended up going to yep and that was when like things really i, I don't know did things a lot, a lot of things changed then because yeah when that happened? That, that's kind of the assignment that did me in as a photojournalist oh really um, i if we're looking back at it you know, I did 9-11 before that, and that was really taxing, and I had my first child. And then Katrina happened, um, and uh, let's see, Ellie was born oh, quite a bit later. But uh, it's just, you know, as a photojournalist, it's one of the most fascinating careers you'll ever have. But you're always on. You don't have to take any time off. Uh, during 9-11 was the one time I went to France with two film cameras. Didn't bring any digital bodies. Uh -huh. And, you know, that was a critical mistake because I almost didn't get to go cover... Uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan after that I, only, I was only in Pakistan but the point is I learned that that one time I put my guard down and brought two film cameras it was nearly a career mistake Interesting. luckily they had me buy a camera in London and I went out and I got my cameras weeks later so you were in France and then you got sent to I was in Paris with my father and 9-11 happened and oh, wow. you couldn't come back to the States so I said well 
why don't you go to Pakistan? And I'm like, I'm a sports photographer, dude. I don't know. And when bullets fly, I hit the ground and I stay down. And they're like, well, you know, you're the only photojournalist from the Times that can get out there because we can't get anyone there. Everyone country. was grounded, yeah. Right. So I was like, uh, okay. And uh, that kind of changed my life, you know, and uh, had some pretty close calls there, even though it was only in Pakistan. It wasn't where the real stuff was in Did Afghanistan. Did you have any training before you went to the I first time? I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So the, the best advice I have for people that ever get in a situation is I found veteran war photographers that knew what they were doing. A photographer named Patrick Aventurier, uh, who I'd known since I was like 15, who worked at Gamma. Uh-huh. And I worked for a big U.S. paper that had resources to get fixers and cars. And he had 20 years of war photography experience, if not more. And we were a perfect couple because we worked for he worked for a French agency and I worked for a new U.S. newspaper that had no conflicting. Uh-huh. And uh, he uh, saved my life a few times, literally. Really? Yeah. How, so how did he this, save- this image you're showing right here, uh, we shot, um, we found out that these two people and a kid had been executed one bullet to the head. Oh, man. Um, just right after the war started. Uh, meaning when the, the Americans started to bomb Afghanistan, that was officially when, you know, the offensive started. Uh-huh. And there were some protests, and these three people uh, were kind of executed summarily as an example by uh, the Pakistani government to say, no protest here, we'll kill you. Wow. And we found these people, uh, and we found the, the morgue. And then luckily we told our colleagues that we were going to go to this town instead of holding on to what was effectively an exclusive. These were the first casualties in Pakistan of the uh, the, fir- the post-9-11 war. And we went to the town, and when we got there, we were met by some very irate police officials uh, that pointed AK-47s at our head. Oh, my God. And just as that was going, and I was literally grasping oh, and fighting with another guy with an AK-47 in my arms, uh, our colleagues, who we told where we were going, pulled up and started taking pictures, and that pretty much Stopped diffused it. the situation. I don't oh know my what happened after. You know, so, That's scary. That's really scary. Yeah, I mean, it's not exactly what you... It's not like being on the 100-yard line of the Super Bowl. And people no, always say, no. like, are you nervous? I'm like, no. Well, we should, we should back <laughs> up a little bit, because yeah, sure. I'll keep going through these a little bit, but we sure. should back up, because your um, background, like you said, was in sports photography. Yeah. You used to, to do work for all sport. That was Correct. sort of your big... Which became Getty, yeah. Which became Getty. So let's yep. bounce over to sports here. You can see sure. some of your sports work. Some of this yeah. stuff's not necessarily from those years. Correct. But, um, can you tell, tell a little bit about how you got into to shooting sports and, and how Oh, that... it's total... Like most things in my career, it's total happenstance. Um, I went to college at Northwestern. Uh-huh. Didn't know what a first down was. Didn't know anything about football. I was a French kid, even as a you know an 18-year-old. And... Uh, the first year I was there, Northwestern was known for having the worst baseball, uh, basket, uh, sorry, the football team in the world. For like 70 years, they had not won anything. Uh-huh. Uh, so the first year was miserable. You know, I'd wear leather jackets to winter games and get <laughs> drenched and ruin my clothes. I mean, all the rookie mistakes. But the second year I was there, Northwestern went to the Rose Bowl for the first time, I think, in 70 years. Uh-huh. And if that doesn't make you a sports fan... Nothing well. It was uh-huh. like one of those amazing stories. The whole Midwest came back to life. All the Northwestern people came back to life. I got to go to that first game where they defeated Notre Dame at Notre Dame, which is unheard of. You know, it's like the Cubs beating the Yankees back in the day right. when the Yankees were on top. Right. And um, it, it turned me into a sports photographer. I found that I was relatively good at manually focusing a 400-2.8 or at that time a 300-2.8. So you were manually focusing back yes, in those days. Yes, that's what started my sports career is I okay. was able to actually focus a camera by hand. And I didn't know anything about the sport. I was an idiot. But I, I could get sharp pictures. Uh-huh. And next thing you know, that led to me photographing Michael Jordan's last five seasons. And next thing you know, I became one of the sports photographers at Getty Images. So things just kind of happen sometimes. You know, life chooses things for you. Never had the intention of being a sports photographer. And then when you made that transition to um, the New York Times, yes. how, how did that transition happen? Who, did they reach out to you? Did you apply? Or what, what was I don't want to bore people. It's an interesting story. I, I worked for All Sport before they were a corporation like Getty. And they didn't really have like, you know, comp days or days off. So I worked 272 days without a day off. Uh-huh. And I burnt out. I got mononucleosis. Oh, that's right. And I threatened to quit because they wanted me at 11 p.m. to drive for a 6 a.m. assignment in San Diego. And I said, three things are going to happen. I'm going to crash and die. I'm going to say something really stupid to Martina Hingis and get fired. Uh Or, you know, I'm going to screw up the shoot and I'm just not doing it. And, you know, we butted heads and I came in with my resignation letter. And my boss at the time said, okay, okay, chill out for the weekend. And I was ready to quit. I went to see a doctor uh, that night. 
waited three hours in the ER. And after three hours, he said, you're depressed and you hate your job, go away. And I said, do me a favor, do a blood test. I've never felt this tired. Turns out I had mononucleosis. I went back to New York for three to six months to recover. And uh, out of the blue, uh, the photo editor, Steve Giselli from the New York Times, who yeah, I met at the yeah. Super Bowl or something like that, uh -huh. I said, hey, there's a job at the New York Times.com. Are you interested? And I just went for it. Uh, after three days, I knew it was the worst job of my life because it was in a cubicle and I can't uh, stay yeah. in an office. The dot com. So you were actually working as an editor or something? I was a, I was a, a, little, a little monkey putting photos into <laughs> the New York Times dot com, resizing. Uh -huh. And for me, that wasn't a problem. It was working in an office. I just can't do it. Right. I, I like to be outside. And six months later, I got very lucky when Jeffrey Salter left the New York Times, who had also been a mentor of mine at the Miami Herald. Uh -huh. It was a very small world. Oh, that's right. You were and at the Miami I, Herald. And I got that. his position. Oh, okay. And, uh, one of the best things that ever happened in my life. Wow. Yeah. And so right now we're kind of taking a peek at the Katrina uh, mm -hmm. stuff that you've been doing. And, yep. and what was really, I think, unique about your access to this was that you had a helicopter. Right. And you had already started prior to this shooting Correct. from helicopters in yep. New York. You had yep. this famous Bryant Park photo mm -hmm. of shooting down, which was for... From a roof. Almost, oh, actually. it's from a roof. Oh, yeah. okay, that's right. Yeah, the first but, one was from a roof. But yeah, that was a, a big that was a big deal photo for yeah. you because I think it made it on the front page Correct. and then it got all sorts of... Yeah pre-social airplay right right tv networks mm -hmm. and the today show i remember all that um but uh then you really started doing these aerials. was this when you really started doing aerials uh or was i it preceded this by a few years but again aerial something i is a poor choice of word but i fell into yeah um you didn't invent that no i didn't okay. invent it just and checking. i they sent me one day to just shoot aerials and i was like well it's kind of like sports you only get one go at it. They're not going to score the touchdown a second time. A helicopter never finds the same spot in the moment. It never happens again. Right. And it's long lenses, at least the way I like to shoot it. And um, I just kind of started doing aerial stuff. And I every time I would come back with something they could use, so they kept sending me and next thing you know, you know, it's became a specialty that I did. And, you know. and you've been now all over the world. This looks like it was Hawaii, right? Mm -hmm. You did yeah. a lot of work in Hawaii. Yeah. And, and you've, you've since... Um, you, actually, I should say you, you won the Pulitzer Prize for the uh, work you did in Pakistan. Right. Correct? Yes. So it ended up being a, a worthwhile With two other trip. photographers. With two other yeah. photographers. Yep. Who were the other two? Uh, James Hill and Tyler Hicks. And Tyler Hicks. Okay. Yep. Not a not a bad group of photographers I'm there. Definitely happy to be part of that group. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and uh, so, okay. So so then you, you ended up moving on from the New York Times. It, mm -hmm. it, like, I, I think that... This podcast might have a lot to. The, the the subject of this podcast is transition. Sure. Because you you you've certainly transitioned. I think we both transitioned. You know, mm -hmm. myself involved included. I mean. Yep. Um, and now you're working more in in the video world. Mm -hmm. You're 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 doing. Can you talk about that transition? Because I know that it was, we worked together on a few yeah. things, but it was basically Canon coming well, out with a new camera, right? Right. So, I mean, just to proceed that a little bit, in 2008, I wrote this article on my, my blog, which at that point was, you know, just a personal blog. Right. Um, and yeah, I wrote an article, an article called The Cloud is Falling, where here I was a staff photographer for the New York Times with a fantastic salary, fantastic benefits and everything. But I saw what was going on in the industry in terms of the dot coms, in terms of the transitions away from print towards online. And I said to myself, with all these market forces going on, I can't see print having a long-term go at this. Uh -huh. And I also had the desire to experiment a little more. I really respected what photojournalists do, which is we don't ever affect the photographs. We don't tell people where to stand. We don't relight stuff. For the most part, we're very hands-off. Uh -huh. But that can be very constricting creatively because you'll wait an entire day for a streak of light to come across the street. It happens once a year, and the woman in the red dress finally walks through there magically, like by magic, but she's picking her nose. Or oh, right, right. someone yep. walks in front of you and your whole day is gone. And after a decade or more of doing that, you're like, I really wish I could light that street cast the person, tell her how to do it, and do several takes with it. And that's what kind of led to my transition to commercial photography and then eventually film. Uh, the film thing was very simple. In 2008, I think it's 2008, uh, I went to Canon for lunch, and uh, I saw these two little white boxes come in, and I followed them like a little dog or a puppy, and I said, ooh, ooh what's that? Uh -huh. And they were very upset at me, and they made me sign an NDA. And they're uh -huh. like, jeez. And I said, well, can, what's inside? Mm -hmm. They're like, here it is. It's a Canon 5D Mark II. It's, I don't know, 18 megapixel or whatever it was. It shoots X amount of frames a second. Oh, and shoots video. I'm like, excuse me? You know, like our, our elves, the little point and shoots. It shoots video. It's no big deal. And I'm they like, didn't think anything of this. No, they were like, they didn't even know what it was. And I said, well, can I see? I'll never forget walking around the office with a 24-70 on a 5D full frame sensor. And it's not like the light bulb went on. It literally shattered. I was like, 
this will change everything. So for four hours, I badgered them to let me borrow it over the weekend. They said no for four hours straight. They got so tired of saying no that they said, just take it over the weekend. My, my winning argument was that one of the photographers figured out there were four photographers they were sending it to, was not going to get back in until Wednesday. Uh-huh. And it was on a Friday. And I said, why don't you lend me the camera over the weekend? Just let me play with it. And um, I'll send it back on Monday via FedEx to, to uh, uh, play, uh, play back more. Uh-huh. And uh, they said, okay, fine. And uh, Mike was there with me, Mike Eisler. I remember they handed me the camera. No manual, one battery. They didn't know what it, format it shot in. Uh-huh. I'm trying to shoot a, a little short with one battery. Right. And Mike was, I had to do a talk for Canon that night. I'll never forget it because there was a, a blind person in the front row. It was very distracting because I couldn't figure out why she was there to see photographs. Right. But uh, it's just, it's burned in my memory. And Mike was stuck in the car. It was raining. I remember that. Reading, not, not a manual, just trying to figure out the camera by retro engineering. No one knew how this thing worked. Uh-huh. And um, we got two models, and we just shot, you know, a terrible little cologne commercial called Reverie. And uh, that changed my career overnight. It was one of the first things I did that went, quote, unquote, viral. Uh And uh, I'll never forget refreshing the blog and seeing five views, 50 views, 500, 2,500, 25,000. It was like... We, we had more traffic on Canon's server in that week than the entire year combined for every division, photocopiers and that. And it was, ma- it was an amazing experience. Yeah. So speaking of going viral now, uh, you've mm-hmm. had a number of things. That was one of your first big things that have mm-hmm. gone viral. You've had a couple other movies. And, yep. and a lot of it had to do with you know this sort of cutting edge mm-hmm. technology that you've sure. been working with. But recently, just yep. recently, and I should pull this up, uh, you, you've had your biggest... Vi- you've had a big virus, <laughs> I guess, right? Yeah. Um, and it was had to do with this shoot that you that right. you did. Yep. Can you tell me what you did this shoot originally for and sure. how it became so viral? Um, I don't, can't explain how it became viral. What I can tell you is that uh, this was a oh, wait for the fire. We truck. got the New York fire Hopefully truck. Hopefully, they're coming not through. coming here. Wave to them. Hi. Sorry, you actually miss that when you don't live here. <laughs> yeah. You really but do. When they wake you up in the middle of the night, you're like, you really don't need sirens at four o'clock in the morning, do you? No. But I no. guess it's policy. Anyways, uh, Men's Health Magazine contacted me saying we'd, we're doing this uh, piece on psychology, on coincidence, you know, and I said, can I read it? And I said, you're a photographer. Can you read? You don't read. I'm like, I can read. <laughs> and they're like, what's well, a really long article? I'm like, I went to journalism school. I can read. <laughs> so they sent it to me and I said, you know what? And this is a good example of it. Uh, whenever I fly in a commercial aircraft, like you know American Airlines or whatever, and I look out the window, since I've been 13 or 15 years old, I've wanted to take pictures of these lines uh-huh. in the streets because it's very geometrical and it kind of looks like brain synapses or a computer chip. Yeah, yeah. And they were like, "Yeah, I guess." And I'm like, um, "I'd really like to go up at night at a very high altitude." And they were very hesitant because they'd never seen it before. Right, right. No one ever actually. I found out. It's probable that no one's ever shot from that altitude at night, Mm -hmm. and it's probable because no one else has seen it. I can't claim I was the first one to do it, but it's a result of the fact of these new cameras coming out, shooting at such a high ISO, 6400 ISO, and give you a really clean image, both in medium format and on 35 mil, which Uh is amazing, Uh and that's why you're seeing all this stuff here. So anyways, uh, I shot it. They almost didn't go for it, but I was just kind of like with the 5D Mark II, I kind of didn't let go. Uh, which I think is a good quality to have, you know, for any photographer or creative these days is to stick to your guns. Uh-huh. And uh, we publish this on on a platform called Storehouse. That was another thing I wanted to talk to you yes. about is this Storehouse. I, yes. I think I signed up for it, but I haven't started using it. Yeah. I, I noticed you've really been an adopter of it. Yes. Yeah, so it's actually, it's made by a friend of mine uh, named Mark Coano, who used I used to work with at, at Apple. He was uh-huh. one of the UI designers uh, for Aperture. Okay. So I got to know him there, and he left Apple and said, I want to start something that hopefully kind of sets a new trend for publishing. What do you do beyond 140 characters? What do you do beyond Instagram when you have a series of images or media, and you want to kind of tell a little broader story with yeah. one, four, five, 50 images and some text? Right. And that's what Storehouse tries to do. It's on your iPhone or your iPad. It's the single most elegant way to get a series of images from that um, onto uh, – this, this story took me about half an hour to put up. 
Yeah. Mostly because of writing the text. Uh huh. It's very painless, and it's a beautiful way to showcase your images. Yeah, really. I mean, the full screen images look really yeah. nice. And and I was noticing on it too. It's got the same sort of uh, situation where you can go to your home yeah. page. Yep. And it's like you know Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, but maybe yeah. I don't know about the terms. It's of service, trying to probably. be the next thing. And full disclosure, I've still become, so I've become an advisor to them, just kind of help them this thing grow. But so I have I think some. You probably in. had a little help. You've helped them help this thing grow yeah, for we, sure. It's with a mutually them. beneficial relationship, and I love the platform. So. But I think I saw you had. Yeah, right here you got forty one thousand followers already. Yeah. So I mean that's no, a, that's an, up. that's another what's I that? I haven't seen that number. Yeah, look yeah, at that. It's pretty, cool. pretty amazing, huh? Yeah. And um, what's really cool about it all, uh, I think, just in general, these different types of uh, social platforms yeah. that maybe we should talk about is gathering that following. Yeah, and and how that sort of changed things uh, in a way because. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that you know the power of, of social media, how one thing you post can go viral yep. in a good way or a bad way. Even. Oh, uh, you know, and, a and friend you, of mine tweeted something about some unannounced Canon camera last week as a joke. And I had to tell him to just take that off because I made a joke five years ago where I said, well, if the 5D Mark VI were to come out next week, meaning I thought people would catch, this is back in the 5D Mark II, right. would catch on. I was talking about a camera that was four generations forward, ergo one that does not exist. Right. You know, the ex- I couldn't tell you about it. And, of course, some German blog picked it up and said, LaFerre announces Canon 5D Mark VI coming out next fall. And I was oh like, boy. come on, guys. And all the calls that I get from Canon, oh, no. whenever I make a joke or anything, they don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> because if you think about it, if I, if I were to announce any camera, no one's going to buy any of the current cameras until that camera comes out. So it has a very oh, yeah. it negative effect, impact. Yeah. Right. So I just usually just say nothing. Right. You know, and um, anyways... That's social media. Back to that. So yeah, yeah. Social social media. Um, I, you know, you you have a great social following on mm-hmm. on Facebook, on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, you do use Instagram, right? Yeah, you do. A little bit. I, now that I'm the storehouse, I've kind of stopped Instagram, and I'm just I just tweet, blog, and storehouse basically. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so storehouse is just taken over for where you're going to start posting photos because yep. through that you can also post that to to Facebook and yep. Twitter in the same way that Instagram could. Yep. It's just a very elegant way of doing it. It's a very simple way. Yeah. Uh, I find uh, uh, blogs really painful, uh, WordPress, and tweets very limiting. It's, it's sure. you, know, you can only say so much. So Storehouse has been a pretty cool place. Yeah. Um, and uh, do you do you know anything? I mean, obviously, the mm-hmm. you know Facebook and Instagram have these really bogus terms terms of service. They have the best terms. They of service have the best I've terms seen. of service. The first so thing I looked at addressed that. Yep. That's that's good to hear. So I mean, everybody, it's just storehouse. You all, storehouse.co. Co. Download it on your iPad, iPhone, whatever, and uh, it's Start it's the following. best terms of service. Yeah. Okay. Keep all your rights. That's great. Um, and and then so that brings up another um, topic I want to say. You know, you've you've gone from staffer to mm-hmm. a freelancer yep. and you've diversified. You've really yep. diversified what you yep. do. Ever yep. si- I mean, obviously you got into the your career shooting sports and mm-hmm. that's a very small piece of that yep. pie, yep. of the photography pie. Mm-hmm. Then you moved into more photojournalism, right. portraiture, mm-hmm. aerial work, and then you moved into freelance where you were able to move out of just editorial right. into commercial, which yep. opens up, I guess, the... The, the 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 source of revenue correct uh, which is really great for any photographer yep. to figure that out um and then you went into video which obviously yep. is yet another do you, do you feel that you're some people tell me some people talk to me i've had people in this seat in, fr- in front of me and they've mm-hmm. said something like along the lines of it's really important to just specialize in one thing mm-hmm. i kind of have the attitude of well why specialize in one when i can specialize in many mm-hmm. and and be able to figure out other streams of revenue and right. and whatnot. I, I think in an ideal world, it's always best to specialize in one thing and mm-hmm. master it instead of being the master of none. Yeah. The reality is in this modern world, you have to multitask. That's right. Whether you're on the phone or tweeting or doing multiple things. Uh-huh. But as a business person, um, there are ebbs and flows. And what kept me in business was that there were times when I didn't do as well in editorial photography, but the commercial work would pick up. Uh-huh. And sometimes there was no commercial work, but uh, the video work picked up. Yeah. Sometimes there was no work anywhere and the blogging picked up and became yeah. a source of revenue. And then that became too much for me to deal with. So I actually stopped doing a lot of blogging and I went back to do other stuff. It, can, I, get, it can become overwhelming. It, I mean, the, after the, the emails after Reverie, nearly put me out of business. The Reverie was the video that you produced the, yeah, for the, the 5D Mark II. The original video. Got, we were getting so many emails that we missed so many jobs just in the in the fray. You know, I got invited to shoot the All-Star game from a blimp. 
and I didn't see it till after the All Star Games. Things like that. You're like, yeah. gah, you know. And uh, because you're getting, I was getting six to seven hundred seven hundred emails a day. Wow. And we're three of us trying to stay up, with, keep up with them. So it can be overwhelming. Yeah. That's why I don't make my email public or anything. We just try to protect yourself a little bit. Right. And uh, you learn the hard way. And uh, social media is a very powerful thing. Yeah. And it's a responsibility. And the, and the best rule about social media, it's the simplest thing. It's the thing I learned in the New York Times. Good content begets, you know, good viewership. Right. The moment you start putting garbage out there, it's over. No one's going to keep listening some, to what some you Some people feel the need to keep pumping information into it just to feed the beast. I tried that at one point with the blog. Uh, for about a year, I hired someone to work with me and help. You know, I, I've written every single thing you've ever read on my blog, but you know, I had people put images in and links and whatnot. Yeah. And after a year, I was like, it's like a feeding a beast. Yeah. And it's not what I want to do. So I actually let go of 22 sponsors, you know, and wow. I, yeah. it's not firing, but I kind of fired them <laughs> saying nothing personal. I'll still work with all you guys. Right. I just don't want to get money from you guys every month and have to post about every press release you guys do because it's killing my, my audience. Right. And, um, you know, that I now have three or four sponsors for the blog and it's very simple and they don't really have any demands. Yeah. And I write about what I want. And so some photographers, you know, when they get to a certain point, they start mm -hmm. getting sponsors like yourself. Yep. And, and that's a good point, too, is, is sometimes you bite off more than you can chew. Yep. And it's great to, to make all these connections and, and whatnot. But, you know, at some point you have to live your life and, and yep. be able to have a bit of sanity. Right. Uh, let's move on to workshops. Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned we met at the sports shooter workshop, yep. which was when we were all dressing up in uh, Hawaiian, mm -hmm. Hawaiian shirts and yep. being silly and drinking yeah. and whatnot. Um, and then... You, we also were part of uh, the Eddie Adams workshop. Um, mm -hmm. Many years, you've uh, worked as a you know the, the leader of, of those groups. Yep. Um, last year, I, I helped produce a team, which mm -hmm. was pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, how, how do you feel about workshops and for for younger folks? Uh, important? Not important? I think it's critical. I mean, uh, you mentioned I, you know, helped you out and mentored you or whatever, uh, which is a pretty big word, but uh, I'm flattered that you do think that. Uh, I got there because people mentored me when I was 15, 16, 17, 18, and to this day, yeah. I've had mentors that have guided me for my career. I would not be here were it not for the generosity, especially in photojournalism, where although there are some really good programs out there like Western Kentucky, Columbia, North Carolina, whatever, uh, for the most part, most of this business is taught from one photographer to another. I mean, Marilyn Yee is here, uh, who was a colleague of mine at the New York Times. She helped me out when I was there. All the colleagues at the New York Times, for the most part, would help me out. I was very young compared to most of them, so it was very odd for me to be like a 26-year-old or something like that, Right. Um, surrounded by veteran photographers yeah. who you know, knew the city like the back of their hand. And um, you learn by listening. Right. And workshops are that experience. Uh, and the, the best thing people should know is that they should all try to teach whatever they can because it forces you. The best gift I was given was I was 20, 23, 24 years old or something. Uh, I was asked to teach at the Pointer Institute by a mentor of mine named Ken Irby, who used yep. to be the assistant director of photography at Newsday. Right. And I was like, Ken. Uh, I'm like 20 something years old and you want me to teach 40 year old journalists right. who are yeah. coming in for a journalism retreat and how to do this. He's like, yeah, absolutely. And it was the scariest thing of my life, but the best thing I got anywhere and did for me because it forced me to actually look at what I was doing, how I was doing it. Cause when you have to teach someone, you have to really be introspective and say, why do we do it like this? Is this the best way? Cause I'm going to teach another generation or at least group of people. Right. on how to do it, right. let me really examine how I'm doing it to make sure I understand right. not just how we do it, but why and if it's the best way, it's the best gift you can get. You can get Teaching other people is one of the best gifts for yourself. It's a yeah. very selfish thing, actually, because you see other people you know, really gain from it and you gain from yourself. Yeah. Um, it, it's one of those things. I, I, I've only spoken a few times and I've always felt awkward about doing those types yeah. of things because I still feel myself as a puppy in this industry. Mm -hmm. And what I really enjoyed about these podcasts that I've been starting is that I'm able What's to... What's beeping? Oh, it's, we're, in a, we're in a store. So. I know. Okay. <laughs> All right. um, we, uh, uh, what was I saying? Um, these podcasts are great yeah. because I'm able to like talk with folks like you and, yeah. and have other people sort of... Uh, tell the audience it's not necessarily me trying to say this is the way to do things I'm able right. to have these conversations sure. and um, ever since I've moved to New York that's what I've so enjoyed is there's so such a wealth of mm -hmm. great photographers in this industry mm -hmm. and we can really um, learn a lot from folks oh, like yeah. you so it was it was it was all it all was founded in 
Like I, I'm always having coffee with you or, or other photographers. Why not just start recording those conversations? Yeah, it's a great idea. So, um, okay, cool. So now, so so in, in with workshops, you did this directing motion yeah. uh, tour, which yeah. I actually have a photo. I I, I stopped into Another one of you. One, huh? Oh dear God! Well, it's not bad. I promise you. Um, right. I actually stopped in and uh, took a photo. But you guys had you had like 300 people at this thing. I I mean I've. It was it's not that much, but well, we try to keep hundred. it to over about under two hundred. Under two hundred, okay. Well, maybe there's two hundred people there. But yeah, that maybe. is incredible. I mean, you yeah. did this on it like almost daily basis. This was my last stop. This was so your last I barely stop. remember it. <laughs> I remember Pete and his son being there. It's my only, and that's my only recollection of the whole thing. Yeah, um, because it was my thirty second stop, and this happened. It was very funny, and this is a point I'd like to make because I turned forty yesterday. Yeah, happy birthday. Uh, you get a little introspective, and you realize when you look back at your life that you have these goals and you work towards them, but things just kind of happen in the way that sports photography happened, in the way that nine eleven happened, in the way that the five D Mark II happened. Uh, I broke my arm very badly in January of last year yep. into like five pieces. I remember that. And um, I had been dis- debating for about a year whether or not I should do this workshop because Alex Bono, a good friend of mine and a fantastic teacher and the director of photography of Saturday Night Live, had done one called um, The Art of Visual Storytelling. And everyone loved it. I went to it. It was a fantastic workshop um, done by a company called MZ. Yeah, that's that was my arm. You can this take was this was his arm before people you know <laughs> hurl all over the screen. <laughs> the, well, the worst thing about a broken bone like that is when your doctors pull out their iPhones and take pictures of it in the ER to oh, share no. with their friends. You know you've done it really well. <laughs> you know you've done well. And the nurses gasp. Well, you've always been one to to push some things to the extreme and that's when it comes the, to the funniest quote from that was from my friend so you really don't half ass anything do you <laughs> no exactly exactly so anyways um, we uh, I was in bedridden or couch ridden they wanted me to sit up for three months and uh, I had an air cast there was no operation on that believe it or not I went to one of the top orthopedic surgeons in uh-huh. New York uh, Dr. Przansky who said I could operate on you tomorrow but there's a high likelihood you'll never regain some function of your wrist. And they've actually put your bone back pretty well together. This was in, uh, in uh, Dubai. Uh-huh. Uh, so you happen to be in Dubai I also. I was in Dubai so with Tom Lowe, the, the guy who does Timescapes, a good friend of mine. And we, I was in a uh, dune buggy that rolled over onto my arm. And so I went there. But the whole long winded story is to say that I had been debating doing a workshop for a year. And I was always very afraid that, you know, the old adage, those that do, do, and those that don't teach. And I didn't want to become that guy who was just teaching. And also, I'm relatively new in the film business. It's only been about uh, six years now. Mm-hmm. So, but because I had a broken arm, I ordered 100 Blu-rays, or 120, <laughs> and I had two and a half months to I just sit this. and watch yeah. them. Yeah. And I watched them voraciously. I did the one thing I'd always wanted to do. I always had this fantasy as a kid that someday I'd have my own private theater. I could watch my favorite films. Uh-huh. That's never going to happen. But you never know. Maybe, but. It was the I, I said, well, let me at least watch my hundred favorite films and break them down, you know, in the way I would break anything down with pen and paper and the structure of how they were shot, and it led to directing motion tour, which I did over you know thirty two cities. And 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 what was that experience like? I mean, you were just talking about overextending mm-hmm. yourself. Yeah. And this sounds like something that's, you know, you did what 20, 20 thirty two cities, thirty two cities, yeah, thirty five hundred so people. So it's almost like being on tour with a band. I mean, you're going exactly, busing. It was exactly the same thing. From place to place, yeah, hotels. It was more brutal. Night. I had people on the on the band on the tour that do bands. They said this was exponentially more brutal. And I'm sure that you know by the time I saw it, which was your last stop here in New York, mm-hmm. you just had it down to a science. You you yeah. seem like every it just seemed so fluid. Yeah. In, from my opinion, and yeah, I don't know what thanks. it was like the first time, but yeah. uh, it seemed like you really had uh, a lot of really. Well, when you do repeat yourself thirty-five times, thirty-two times, and all the uh, same jokes, all the all the staff are just going, "Oh God!" You're trying, you're <laughs> trying to make keep it fresh, but right. yeah, it's uh, you know, it's good information, and I I, I enjoy teaching that stuff because who doesn't enjoy like breaking down your hundred favorite films? Yep, yep. Um, so I also noticed that you you do a lot of talks at, at different trade shows, at, at like mm-hmm. PPE, and and I'm I've only gone to yep. in terms of trade shows, Photo yep. Photo Plus here in New yep. York. Do you do that at other other expos as well? I pretty much have limited it to Photo Plus and an NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters, in Vegas, and that's in April. And Photo Plus is always in October. Uh-huh. And I mostly do it for social reasons. I see all my friends once a year. It's where we all get together. Right. Every time I get on those stages, I, I it's painful. It's painful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how, how that's another thing is like getting into this sort of speaking career mm-hmm. you've got gotten yeah. into. So. Um, 
you know, one of the things is like if someone's ever asked me to do a, a talk, it's like, oh God, I got to put together something, figure it's, out what to It's show. a lot of pressure because you, you want to show your stuff and you, you're talking about yourself. Like that's what I enjoy about the tours. I was talking about other directors work. Yeah, there you go. And that's much more fun for me. Talking about myself, especially when you're saying the same thing more than once gets really tiring. Right. And you, and you dislike Michael Bay's, uh, was that what it was? His yeah, the uh, the yeah the Michael Bay cam the, the Michael the, Bay cam the, uh, <laughs> the Bay Rama or something or, yeah <laughs> well you get to you know, Bayham Bayham there you go your Bayham um, yeah so so I mean do you do you have just a, a certain sort of like do you have to go through and, and every time you speak is it a different talk do you or I try. Do you, yeah. That's what gets makes it more difficult. Every I try to make every single talk tweak a little bit, a little different, so that because I'm sure there's interested. a lot of the same people in some of the audiences yeah, as well. Yeah, it's just like I hate repeating myself. Yeah, and and now and you know nowadays when you are thrown up on YouTube and you, yeah, exactly. it ends up being the same thing over yep. and over. So, yep. um, so uh, what else is going on uh, with you? You got anything upcoming that you want to talk about? I guess uh, it's a little premature, but this this project from uh, on Storehouse called Gotham Seven Point Five K kind of went ridiculously viral uh -huh. um I've, it's still spreading and uh, we're talking to a few companies and it's looking really good that we're going to take it worldwide uh -huh. we've actually shot four cities additional in the in the country and we'll start releasing that shortly wow and uh it's taken on a total life of its own one thing leads to another leads to another it's like you know like i was ready to you know say the photography thing's over because i would get hired once a year yeah and now i'm looking at going around for one year around the world Wow. Taking pictures. Wow. And possibly video too, but um, it's really interesting. And I'm sure that'll lead to something else down the line. Well, that's the thought. I mean, you know, this one's kind of a guilty pleasure. Who would want to fly around the world for a year and take pictures? Yeah. So uh, I'm still pinching myself. I, I can't. I can't wait to see what comes of it. So speaking of flying around the world, I wanted to yeah. show this quick video, if you don't mind, of sure. of when when you and I went out. You had a, a photo <laughs> shoot for the um, what was it? Um, New York Magazine. New York Magazine to yeah. photograph the um, people that survived that flight that landed into the Hudson. Yeah. So this is a, a, a photo shoot I went out on you with, just to give people an idea. We added some nice music to it as well. You didn't go out on me, you just went with me. Went with you. Yeah, with you. Just clarify that. Took the passenger seat. <laughs> I should also mention we went out with uh, Mike Eisler, who's here in the audience. He was, he's your heli tech, I guess we call it. Yep. Aerial technician. Aerial technician. So the idea was that you were taking pictures of uh, this uh, couple that met on the plane that crashed. Right. In the crow's nest of a fire boat yeah. and you rented out <laughs> you actually rented out a water taxi here yeah and had an assistant with lighting units big pro uh -huh. photos or something that you were remote remoting using, <laughs> using, using as an pocket angle wizards. Light, through pocket wizards and the coolest so i had so there's, there's like a bunch of seven b's there <laughs> and uh what i really remember about this is you'll see a shot of quaz the pilot and you'll see the strobes going off, and you see it in his face, and you look at the intensity of this pilot. is amazing. So Mike was communicating to, uh, who was it, Mike? To the but ground, to the, the people there on the, on the boat right there. Dustin, that's right. And uh, so Dustin's on the taxi boat. You can see the flash. The strobes yeah. going off. And that's one of the shots, yeah. how it turned out there. Yeah, you can and see this a little was your cover, bit. right? It never made it to the cover. It's one of the few failures I've had <laughs> uh, where it was like, ah. I never really liked the, the concept, to be honest. We try to make it happen. I think the, the, the boat was just weird looking. Yeah, um, it was interesting. And uh, But it was a worthwhile effort. It's the first time I ever fired strobes from a helicopter remotely. Well, I remember I was in, in there trying to take these videos and shoot, yeah. and I got into the, the eye line of the, the... Oh, it's blinding. That's the, why Quaz and, is and so cool. Yeah, Quaz, he just pulled... You'll see it in one of these shots it's where he just up. pulls it back. Uh, but we were hovering here, yeah. like, 10 feet from, Maybe. from yeah. the water in a helicopter oh, making these photos. It, there you, that's the pit. Look at the intensity. <laughs> I mean, it's insane. Anyways, I'll never forget that look. Quaz. Quaz, yeah. Is he, so he's, he's one of your pilots that you yep. work with on, yep. on a regular basis? He flies basis. Uh, a lot of the uh, paramedic flights now and still works for Liberty Helicopter. Oh, okay. Yep. Liberty Helicopter. And that's right, as you can see, right off of the side of Manhattan yep. here. If you're ever driving up the west side highway, mm. you see these, uh, these guys coming in and out mm -hmm. like this. So it's a, and this is just a regular thing for you now nowadays. I mean, it seems like every time you're in New York, 
you'd end up going up at some point. I try. I mean, might as well. If you want to have a great first date, there's no better way than oh, like that <laughs> sunset over New York. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> there you go. It's a near religious experience. I've, yeah, I've never, I've never gone up at sunset yeah. or anything like that, but um, pretty amazing. Uh, pretty amazing that, that you've been able to turn this aerial photography into a real career in its yeah. of its own. Yeah. Um, it's an expensive hobby. Expensive hobby. Yeah. Well, hopefully you get the, the clients to pay for it. We used to, and that's been the other big change is because of the kind of implosion of the print market, better for worse, they don't have the expenses to do that, which is why I only get hired maybe once a year now uh-huh. to do this type of work. And um, what's amazing is because of new platforms like Storehouse and uh-huh. social media, we're looking at funding an entire year's worth of shoots, you ah. know, based on the support of companies and people. And I find that really interesting that we're tr- finding new ways of creating new markets and new opportunities. Well, it is interesting. You know, a lot of people are doing these uh, fundraising mm-hmm. websites yep. like GoFundMe and yep. whatever the other one is. Uh, um, Kickstarter. Kickstarter to, yep. to, to, you know shoot these projects yeah. um, you, have you ever done anything like that no I've always been super reticent to ask people for money yeah. it's just I figured if I'm going to do it I'll do it once for like my first movie or something right but for projects that I can find a way of funding another way, I try to do that. Like we might do a book on the the air series. I think it's a fair bet we will. Uh-huh. That may be a play a way I ask people like pre order a book or something. Oh yeah, yeah. I just don't like the idea of saying, "Hey, help me fund do my project." Right. You know, if it's for charity or if it's helping someone, and it's paying it forward to something else. I think it's totally reasonable. But if it's for you to make your own film or your own book. I don't know. It just feels a little yeah. weird to me. How, how about self-publishing? I mean, that that's a new thing that's, that's really big. Berg, that's, David Bergman, who was on yep. here earlier, um, yep. you know, self-published. Well, yep. I'm actually probably going to do a book with the publisher that published uh, they, that we both know, Warren Winter. Warren Winter, uh, and probably do the book with him. Cool. Yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah. All right. Yeah, all you have to do is look at a regular book deal and go, why would anyone ever sign this? Yeah. At this, you know, it, it's amazing. They they just want. Small, you'd give you a small percentage, well, maybe a little advance, and, and then it's just based off of sales, I think. Well, Depending on your contract. It's not it's, uncommon for people to make 2 to $3 off a $50 or $60 book oh, yeah. as an end user. And that's just That's bad. incredible. That is bad. That is bad. So. Um, I think, uh, lastly, one thing I didn't mention earlier is, is about the whole networking. We talked about social. We talked about trade shows. Mm-hmm. But we, we, we also, when I was... Just a pup, a wee pup, uh, an intern. We started the poker nights, <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, you know we we had I bet I think it was weekly poker nights, and we'd yeah. meet meet up at um, various locations around yeah. New York City, and yeah. it would be a very it was a photo industry po- poker yeah. night, and so many relationships like Warren, uh, yeah. who, who was uh, you were just talking about, I was at his place yesterday in Chicago, yeah, for your birthday, yeah. and um, uh, you know so there's that connection he he's he was a, a photo agent he mm-hmm. still sort of is but mm-hmm. now he's a, a publisher yep um we've got other uh, photographers that have you know made their way up yep. um and and even created some family at the poker night yes. a couple a couple <laughs> people got married even yeah which is pretty neat yep um how, how do you feel do you think do you obviously that was done for more of a social reason but do you yeah. f- think it's important to i think it's critical yeah. i mean social media is wonderful but you can't forget it's still virtual right and there's nothing that replaces one-on-one one real human contact yeah. and exchanges in a non-public forum. Um, and, you know, for me, it started actually, I was at Nucho Denuzzo, who's a Chicago Tribune photographer yesterday as well. Um, and he started a thing called the Map Room when I was back in Chicago, when I was the same age you were when you started. Uh-huh. And uh, every Wednesday, we'd get together, either the, every, every Wednesday or once a month, the first Wednesday, I forget, in a place called the Map Room. And there was one rule, is you don't talk about work. And all the photographers started to come from the Chicago Tribune, the Sun Times, AP, Reuters, AFP. Guys, they would stab each other in the back faster than you can sneeze. Oh, man. But that night, they were friends. And yeah. it changed the whole dynamic. And we started start to understand that it didn't matter if you were for the Tribune or the Sun Times. We were all trying to get a picture. It was all healthily right. uh, competitive. Right. But if someone needed help, you would pull out your lens and say, use mine. You know, yeah. it's kind of the ethos. And those relationships last to this day. So when I came to New York, you know, it's not that I was trying to recreate the map room, but I kind of was. It's kind of a, was our Paris of the 20s. And we would play on your roof, yeah, you know, yeah. and Ryan's roof. Yeah. And we, like you said, weddings came out of it, long lifelong friendships. Yeah. And uh, then I moved to California. Poker kind of died for me. And now I'm back in New York. I try to make it happen. It's a great thing to socialize. And you give with this, we were calling this project the Air Project, the aerial uh-huh. one. Uh-huh. So if you want to interested, you go to storehouse.co slash air uh-huh. or backslash. And uh, 
uh, we are going to make a social aspect of that as well, where I want to, every city we go to, we're going to meet people and have gatherings. It's pretty cool. Oh, way cool. Yeah. That's great. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like... Kind of mix all the worlds together. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to... Hopefully, you'll record it or something and maybe... I haven't got that far. We'll figure. Yeah. We'll, I'll, I'll talk to you about that yeah. later. Um, let's see here. What else uh, was I wanted to mention? I did want to quickly show your, your reel that you have up sure. here. This is the 2000. 13 reel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. Do you, and you have an editor that works for you for these types of things? Or do you put Yeah, I have several editors yourself? I work on. Oh, no, I, I was, that's the beauty of, of film is collaboration. So I always pick other people to right. make it happen. I, one of those things that uh, I've noticed uh, I, with doing videos, fortunately, my, my wife has a, a bit of a um, skill in, in doing mm-hmm. some video editing. So it's made it a whole lot better. But you sure have done a lot of different, different work here. Yeah. Um, was, was 2013 or 2014 that you did your Nike ad? It was last year. Last year. Yeah. So maybe we'll show the show that sure. as well because I think that that's a big pinnacle one. Big deal. I heard you guys destroyed a Canon lens in that shoot. Yep. <laughs> and camera. I still have it at my house. <laughs> oh yeah, I did see it's all yeah. busted up. I asked uh, CPS to send me their oldest 500 mil and 1D, and I said, guys, in the film, he's going to drop this camera, you know, several times, and we're going to shoot it, we're going to do 10 takes, this camera and lens will be unusable, send me the oldest piece of crap that you have. Uh Uh-huh. You're not going to you know, be bothered when you get it back destroyed. Right. They sent me a brand new 500 F4 oh my and a brand new 1D, and I called my friend there, and I said, yo, we're going to destroy this thing. He's like, yeah, we don't have the old ones. You got to just get a bunch of new batch. And he's like, it's insured, you know. Uh, we understand what it's being used for, and just as long as we return the serial number, we're okay. Oh, my gosh. And the next thing I did, it's the only time I've ever done this, I held a 500 F4 and a 1D over concrete, and Blake Whitman was there from Vimeo. And I said, hey, Blake. He said, what? And I dropped it in front oh of him. God. And the look on his face, because I went, oh, whoops. <laughs> and I picked it up, and I did it again. And it made this incredible noise when it, and it didn't get that damaged when you drop it. Yeah. But the whole front was bent, and he was catatonic. He was like, "What is wrong what with is you? Wrong you're losing with your you? mind." How could you do and something? The only mistake like that? I made is I didn't videotape it because I, I was want, just going to say, did you I, videotape I didn't want anyone that? to see it? But my whole purpose is: when's the last time you saw a photojournalist with a brand new lens? They're always beaten up and taped exactly. up. Exactly. So, you know, it, uh, it's interesting. Anyways, that was the, one of the coolest things I got to do. So before we end, I want to... And wanna... if you watch Mobius, you'll see there's a scene where he froze the lens. And every time I would show that short, I would hear the collective thud and people going... <gasps> You know, oh no! The, I just thought it was a fake lens or something like no, that. No, the funny part is like for that we'd have a we had, we had a, like a, a bed uh, spring uh, a mattress. Oh, okay. There, but for the other stuff, no. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so um, lastly, I'm just going to show this 90 second sure. uh, movie that you or I mean commercial you made for yeah. Nike, which is pretty amazing. Um, maybe you can tell me a little bit while we're watching how you ended sure. up. Sure. Getting this, this was gig. shot with a Phantom camera with uh, the Movi and a Steadicam and pretty much every toy in the in the world uh, of Nike athletes. Athletes, Kobe Bryant here. Uh, then came Richard Sherman. He's probably going to be a dad pretty soon. Not one of the nicest guys in the world. Uh-huh. Um, very enthusiastic on this. That was after, just before he. This he is made, before like, he did the Crabtree thing. This is before he was Richard Sherman. Oh, hold on, this drives me crazy. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh, luckily, this didn't happen on the shoot. Yeah. And um, it was uh, it was a really big deal for me as a director to shoot Nike spot. Sure. sure. Everyone's dream. And uh, it was, uh, I lost a few years of my life on it because of all the stress. We had very little time to figure this out. All these things were shot practically, so there's no CGI, there's no recompositing. We had to match shoes with different size shoes, different colors, different athletes' motions. Uh, it was a big deal. And um, uh, Mo Farah, and that was Allison Felix. Unfortunately, we're having some uh, internet, internet issues. issues it seems. It's coming back. But uh, definitely a uh, pretty amazing experience. Um, was it difficult for you? I mean, what was the hardest part of this? Obviously, you were able to have probably more budget than you've ever had before. And the irony is that there wasn't enough budget. There wasn't enough and budget. And the funny thing is you'll listen to people like, um, oh, I'm blacking on his name, from Shawshank Redemption, uh, the director. Um, it'll come oh. back to me. Director. Uh, Darabont, uh, Frank Darabont. He complained about how Shawshank was a small budget film for $20 million. You never have enough money because the reality is you learn as a director, no matter how much money you have, you always want to spend more to make the movie as good as you can. You're always squeezing. Uh Uh, And even on a Nike spot, with the very little, I think we had 
two weeks to prep something this complex with all these athletes coming in from around the world. I had to shoot all of them in two and a half days. Um, well, what was the most stressful part of that? Was it the pre- preparation or like when you're finally on set waiting, like in that athletes come and you're like, oh my God, I cannot 45 minutes flat with each athlete, not 46. And you're trying to move these cameras as fast as Olympic athletes. So it's difficult with someone like Kobe Bryant. But when Allison Felix is running so fast, that oh the God, camera yeah. car can't keep up with her. <laughs> it's kind of a problem. You're trying to do a full loop around her. We did some tests, luckily, because my production company, Great Guns, is so experienced. They're like, let's do some tests before oh, yeah. with non-Olympic athletes. And the vehicle would flip over almost. Just the G-forces are trying to keep up with the athletes. Uh-huh. And it was like, oh, we're in trouble. Uh-oh. So luckily, you go back to, for myself as a director, uh, and I had a co-director on there named Paul Shearer, who's also fantastic. Uh-huh. Uh, you go back to your old days as a photojournalist and problem solving and saying, how do I get from a foot to a full body shot when I can't move the camera fast enough? Right. You use a zoom lens and combine it with the movement. You do little visual tricks. Right. We pull every trick out of the book that we could on this one. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know if anybody uh, that's here today has any particular questions. Um, hi, Keith Bedford's Keith here. Keith Bedford in the house. All right. Um, but uh, I, I might open up to any questions if anybody's got any. Does anybody have any questions for Vince that uh, they want to throw out? If not, it's okay. Dead silence. Oh, bye. Yes. Have you uh, experimented with drones? Yeah, sure. I, I've So Free Fly, the guys that make the Movi, uh, are... Tab for Shaw and Hugh Bell, who are the founders of the company, are my friends, and they started off as an aerial drone company. So uh, I've he, crashed. He quite asked a- about drones. Just, just could we didn't have a microphone on. Oh here. yeah. So to- have, the question was, have I ever experimented with drones? And the answer is, yeah, absolutely. I've crashed a dozen of them. Um, I've never flown one with a real camera on it because that's a hundred thousand dollar mistake. Um, I've flown with really experienced pilots who do it for a living. And uh, just like flying in a real helicopter, it's just dangerous if you don't fly with the right people. And drones scare me more than real helicopters because when you have a problem in a real helicopter, there's a real pilot who can react to it. Whereas with a drone, when you lose a signal, you've got a flying lawnmower that just goes berserk. And that scares me. At the same time, I've kind of gotten a little more relaxed about it because if you start to think of a drone in the same way you start thinking of a moving of a vehicle, I mean, a moving vehicle that goes out of control can kill just as easily, too. So you, you kind of relax you know, yourself a little bit and realize that it's a technology that's out there. It's not going away. Uh, if anything, the FAA rules that are happening right now worry me because they're affecting professionals and requiring them to be licensed, but letting amateurs continue to do whatever they want. Like, everyone should be controlled. These are dangerous things. Or the, the things should be controlled in software, not to go higher than X or not to go near airports. It's not professionals that are flying drones into 747s. It's, it's idiots. Um, and the fact that they're regulating professionals now and not the amateurs worries me a lot. I did a commercial in December where I want to fly a drone in an alley and frankly at five feet the worst thing that could have happened is the drone went berserk and hit a wall you know worst thing worst case or I guess the really worst one is it would fly away which I've actually seen happen just flies away and never comes back (laughs) and that's not good Um, but we had to go for the FAA four weeks advance get a spotter there and it went from being a $12,000 shot to a $50,000 shot and then there was no we didn't do it and that's a problem you know, now, I don't mind having the extra expense if everyone is controlled, just like a driver's license for a car. you got to get a driver's license. You should have to have a license to fly a drone, you know, above 100 feet and of a certain size because it's a dangerous thing. No one – the best thing I can share is no one ever intends to have an accident, right? And, but people stop, don't really think about that. No one intends for the drone to lose control. And what worries me the most about the drones is that people don't know what they're doing, but more of the fact they don't think about the fact that you can just lose control with some wireless interference. It's all around us. We have more wi- – and uh, there's no one – there's no little guy in there flying it back. So, yeah. yeah. How do you feel – It's a wonderful technology, too. You can make incredible shots. Yeah. You so get you, can never get you get angles and moves you can never get anywhere it's else. It's a great tool. It's a great tool. To add to your bag, I guess Yeah, you'd and say. with experienced pilots. How do you feel about that recent uh, White House incident? Well, it's inevitable. I'm surprised there haven't been more fatalities because of drones, because of the pe- what people are doing with it. Yeah. You know? So uh, d- Didn't you do something with some sort of little, like, fake copter or drone or something in Hawaii a while back? That was TAB. 
Tab was the guy who started Free Fly. Oh. That's how I met him, was right after Reverie. He mm-hmm. came out to Hawaii to shoot some aerial stuff with me with the 5D Mark II. Right on. Yeah, and wow. we've stayed friends ever since. Cool, cool. Yep. Um, any other questions before we uh, end this? I think that we're good. I, which I should have checked on uh, Facebook and stuff about questions, but I think that I think that we're pretty good. Cool. So uh, why don't we give do you, do you give away your the social that you that you want to give away? Sure. I mean, uh, you can follow me on at Vincent Laferre. That's L A F as in Frank O R E T. It's a silent T. It's silent T. Uh, you can follow blog dot and I think the most important thing right now is probably storehouse.co slash Vincent. Slash Vincent. Vincent. Oh, yeah. okay. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna get slash Vincent Laferre. Okay, that's Just fine. To- <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick my lawyers on you. <laughs> and then wasn't there a, a something else that you have another like specific um, for your new project to to go to like a yes yeah, so storehouse.co slash or backslash air slash air and that's yeah. going to be all you as well that's going to be this project okay forward. yep very it's cool. be pretty exciting I and mean, we're going to literally come to almost the plan is every major city around the world so Tokyo New York again uh, Rio Sao Paulo Shanghai wow. Hong Kong Paris Abu Dhabi that's the dream and it's looking like it might actually happen. And get Eisler on that, maybe. No, Eisler will cool. be on there. Yep. I'm and sure I'll he'll fly be with anyone else. at some point. Yeah. All right, Vincent, uh, I really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. And everybody else can uh, follow us on Photo Brigade at uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and, and all of the above. And check out our YouTube page. Subscribe mm-hmm. to it. YouTube.com slash C slash The Photo Brigade. Um, and subscribe. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.